Hi there, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. We'll just give people a few more seconds before we get started. So we will begin shortly. All right, so hello, welcome again. My name is Janan. I work for Emerging Destinations. We represent cool companies in cool places. Today, I'm being joined by Nicola from the Guyana Tourism Authority, and we will also be joined by a guest host today, Wally Prince, who is a tour guide and birding specialist in Guyana. So he's going to offer us some of his specialty knowledge as well. Before I hand things over to them, I just want to take a quick minute to introduce our portfolio to you. So as you can see, we have an extensive portfolio all over the world. So I'll just give a very brief introduction, starting with our South American portfolio. We have included in that uh, Patagonia, Chile, Argentina, Peru, of course, Guyana, who we'll be hearing more about today. And then going further north, we have Terra Nova and Costa Rica. Um, Africa, we have Tanzania, Kenya, we also cover Uganda, Rwanda, and South Africa. And then lastly, in our polar cruises, we have Iceland Pro Cruises, who does Iceland, Greenland, and then we also have Adventure Canada, who does the Canadian Arctic. So that is just a very brief go through of the different companies we represent. So if you have any questions about them whatsoever, you can see my email address there at the bottom. You feel free to email me if you'd like any digital links or you know, if you want to order brochures, any questions at all, feel free to reach out. A couple housekeeping items to go over before we get started. This webinar will be recorded. So if you have to step away, take a call, anything like that, don't worry. We will be sending the recording out to everyone later this week. Also, we would like to encourage everyone to participate. So please, if something comes up during the presentation, whether it's a question, a comment, you can send that over to us using the go to webinar control panel located on the right hand side. Nicola will answer any of these questions at the end of the session. If not, we will make sure to send the answers to you in our webinar follow up. So on that note, I'm going to hand things over to Nicola and Wally, who are going to talk to you about Guyana, a birding paradise. Thanks, uh, Jenna. Hi, everyone. My name is Nicola Baller. I'm from the Guyana Tourism Authority, and I am joined by local guide and birder, Wally. Hi, everyone. Hey. Um, like Jenna said, we will be talking about birding in Guyana. We actually do have a video to start off with. I don't know if, um, Jenna, can you assist and let me know which button here plays the video? I think we will. We are having some slight technical difficulties in that, but it actually is on YouTube as well. So just excuse while I switch over the screen very quickly. Yeah. So here you go. The emphasis now over the past few years in Guyana has been leaning more towards birding tourism. A lot of people are coming now because to see birding Guyana is off, we would call off the local tourism track. Um, it's a new frontier. We actually have, in terms of birds, we have over 900 species of birds and over 70 species that are Guyana shown in them. Some of them are easy to see compared to neighboring Guyana shield countries. Guyana is indeed unique in terms of bird because of the diversity of species. You go on a birding trip on there, you know, there are many other mammals that are present. So there are many species that can be observed over the period of time that you are in Guyana. And when you fly over major parts of Guyana, it's uninterrupted forest. Guyana has done a really good job in, in terms of preserving a lot of the environment, which in other countries has, has simply been lost. In a lot of countries, you rely for special 
birds and, and for conservation generally, on little pockets, um, little oases of, of good forest or good habitat. Uh, but in Guyana, you've got a lot, and I hope it stays that way forevermore. Showing people our country, words, our culture, the way we live. I believe one of the best ways of promoting conservation efforts. I love seeing birds. I don't know what is so addictive about bird watching, but when you see the first bird and you get into it, you want to see an excellent, an excellent, an excellent, especially new species. And the more difficult it is to find, it makes it more interesting. You want to go challenge it. Every unique bird and that we run in Guyana you must see the sun parakeet. And that's why we go to Karasala. It's, it is there. However, while saying it is there, they need to be protected. Right for people to protect those very species are the people who live in the communities. I am Andrew Albert from Karasoy. I am the fourth generation of my great grandfather, the founder of this community. And as the years pass by, our population increase in numbers. 1,300 numbers in the population of Karasoy, and mainly the Makushi tribe. We have seen a great change in our community based on the tourism activities. I have to take a step forward to embark on the ecotourism. And the name of my industry is the, the Golden Parakeet, also known as Makushi the Kese. Karasuma is the only place left with the Golden Parakeets. So we started the program creating job opportunities while preserving and conserving the very endangered species in our community. Every individual in the community must become a beneficiary out of this industry that we are embarking on. It could be indirect and direct beneficiaries. And this, this is my plan and this is my dream. Thanks everyone for looking at that. Um, so the very first person to be on that webinar is actually Wally, who is our guest host today. Um, this webinar is going to be in about two or three parts. So the first part will just be some general information on the destination, things about where it's located and where you can find it and some of our key highlighted areas. And then I'm going to turn it over to Wally to go in depth about everything we have to know about birding in Guyana to the key highlighted areas and some of the specific species as well. So this webinar will be done between myself, Nicole Balram, and Waldike Prince, commonly known as Wally. Um, and in the middle, there's a map that says about the key important birding areas that you can find in Guyana highlighted in the highlighter green. So Wally's going to be going through some of these specific areas and the species you can find here as well. Guyana is a rare kind of place, one where you can still find nature in its original form, and sometimes we like to call it nature's beating heart. It's a small South American nation located just below the Caribbean Sea, above Brazil, and sandwiched between Venezuela and Suriname. And it's the only country in South America where English is the native language. This means that even our indigenous peoples here also speak English, and you can have a full conversation with them on your travels in English. Getting to Guyana. Well, we know that flight connections are not um, going right now and travel is not recommended under the cir current circumstances. We thought it'd be good for you to know how to get to Guyana with airlines currently serve and any potential new ones that are coming up in the next year. So some of the major airlines that serve Guyana are Caribbean Airlines, Suriname Airways, Kope Airlines, Liat American Airlines. And you can also get connections with British Airways, Virgin Atlantic, um, to Europe as well. American Airlines has direct flights from Miami and GFK in New York four times a week. Um, they started flying from Miami in 
2019 and JFK in late 2019 as well. Eastern Airlines had planned its service from Guyana in early 2020. However, that has been pushed back and they have not shared a date as yet. Mm -hmm. But JetBlue begins service to Guyana on October 26th of 2020 as well. And this is going to be about four times a week also. Once you're in Guyana, there are three main modes of transportation. You're going to travel around through some of our rugged terrains and vehicles um, in the coastal and city areas as well. That's the most common type. Um, you're also going to travel with jet boats and smaller boats in this on our many waterways and small planes to get to some of the interior and rainforest locations of the country. It's great to know about the country and how to get here, but what is the tourism experience? So we like to categorize it into five main areas. Um, however, it is important to note that any time you do have an experience here in Ghana, you are more than likely touching more than one of this area or even all five at the same time. So Ghana is known for its nature and wildlife experiences, active exploration or adventurous experiences, our culture and heritage, which combines our different races, events, um, historic sites, birding, which this is focused on, and a lot of work in our conservation and safe travel space. Safe meaning scientific, academic, volunteer, and educational travel. 90% of the population lives along the coast, leaving much of the country's interior locations untouched and ready to be explored. Most of this interior location is actually rainforest cover, but throughout the presentation, you're gonna see the different types of landscapes, such as savannas and hilly sand and clay areas as well. Now, no explanation or webinar on Guyana is complete without highlighting Kaitor Falls all on its own. This is one of the highest attractions here in Guyana, and anytime you do get to travel to the destination, it's one of your must stops, um, either going into the rainforest or coming out of it. It's currently 741 feet, which is just about five times higher than Niagara Falls. It is one of the single and most powerful water drop um, waterfalls in the world. So on your trip to Ghana, we are known as the land of six different races or six ethnic groups. And some of the most common faces you're gonna see, especially if you're doing a birding tour here in Ghana is Wally. He's from African descent persons from East Indian descent and our indigenous peoples. Now let's talk birds. Um, throughout the presentation, we're gonna, you're gonna see this map a lot of times just to give you a visual reminder of where we are in the country as we move from place to place. So I am now gonna turn this over to Wally so that he can take you on a journey and we can all learn about birds in Guyana. Take Hi, everyone, I'm Wally Prince and welcome to Guyana and welcome to some of the Guyana birds. Um, we have over 820 species there um, that covers over 70 families of birds across the entire Guyana from the, the coastal parts. So we're talking about the mudflats and the migratory birds, which are some of the more popular ones that would be in groups like sandpipers or plovers or such and going right into the interior or southwards to the bottom of the Guyana map where you will have um, from tipuis to mountain species and such. So in terms of the best times to visit will be from September to December, January to late April. And most of our, as you know, most of our birders, most of the activities generally for wildlife in general um, happens early in the morning into mid morning when it begins to get hot. So that's when most visitors will get you know, what we call a siesta time, and then it picks activity picks up back again at around 3 p.m. and goes into sundown and then into the early night for owling and um, other nocturnal birds, night jars and night hawks and such. Um, areas for birding, there are several main, what we term as biomes or ecoregions we have from rainforests, savannas, um, the white sand area, which we call it the hilly sand area, so the white sand area and um, clay being more coastal. And then you have the coastal plain itself, with, um, which would incorporate the mangroves and some of the plantation habitat secondary growth, which would include Georgetown and areas like Mahaik and, and Abari rivers and, and several other um, unique areas along the coast, including um, islands in the Esquibu River. Um, there, 
many birds to see. As I said, over 800, you know, even 20, pushing 900 plus research species. And um, some of the key ones are that are distributed across the country. Uh, on the coast, we have our national bird, which is a Hawatsin, which the local, our Guyanese name is called the Kanji pheasant. So that's a bird on the coast itself. Um, and as I said, it's our national bird. We also have a bird that would have near, it's a Guyana shield endemic. It would have nearly been a Guyana endemic if it wasn't found, if it didn't um, include Suriname, but it's found both in Guyana and Suriname, really two places. And that bird is called a blood color woodpecker. It's one of our smaller woodpeckers that are more coastal restricted. Um, then they're in our botanical gardens, there are over 200 plus species. So we're talking while you're in the city within what a five minutes um, taxi ride or maybe even a 50 minutes walk, depending on which hotel you're staying at. You have the botanical gardens where on average in the morning, spending an hour and a half there in the afternoon, you can easily get several dozen species of um, birds. Um, and more unique birds that takes a longer you know, journey into the interior and such to see would be some of the our fly catchers as a bearded chichuri, which is a savanna bird, um, crested doradito, which is very range constricted, um, red siskin, which is uh, one of the seed eaters, and those that's a bird that was actually thought to be we are say nearly extinct out of Guyana, but there are now sites in the South Rupununi. So we're talking about the southern part, southern savanna part of the country where you can find that bird. Um, you also have some other specific ones along the Guyana border with Brazil along the Iring River, which is birds as a whole throated spine tail. And we also have the Rio Branco and bird that comes tail up into there. You have along that same area, not too far away, the sun parakeet is one of the other birds there. Going to, in the southern video, going to Kaicho Falls and actually within the Ewokrama area and such, you also have the Guyanan cock of the rock, which is a different color plumage from the Andean or Peruvian, Peruvian cock of the rock. Um, Curacao's, we have both the black Curacao and the crestless Curacao, or what they call lesser raised bill. And the crestless Curacao is a more savanna specific bird. Um, you have some of the more common species and many with the name Guyana inside as Guyana warbling and bird and Guyana streak and trend and Guyana red katinga, Guyana tucanets, so all the ones with the name Guyanas are actually the Guyana shield endemic. Um, some other ones that are a little bit hard to see is brand colored fly catchers, all of sided fly catchers. And you can, um, in a way, many parrots and, and toucans, and also our largest raptor, the harpy eagle. We also have the crested eagle, which is smaller than the harpy and several hawk eagles, which are quite majestic birds in their own. Coming to Guyana, um, your gear or your kit, definitely you should include binoculars, you know, uh, decent binoculars, I would say something like a minimum uh, eight by 35 mm. Um, if you can also maybe a small spotting scope or such, um, you have your day pack, your I would say medications for any, you know, personal medication for yourself. Um, sneakers or hiking boots, and also something like a Tevas, because some activities we do is going into lakes. So you don't need your hiking boots. You're relaxing in a boat for that sundown on the lake, looking at birds, looking at other wildlife, so the sun begins to go down, having a sundown, which, which would be like, you know, the famous Guyanese um, El Dorado rum and such. So having, you know, Having a sun there, no, but having, yeah, having sneak um, sandals or comfortable footwear that you don't, your foot doesn't need to be restricted into sneakers or hiking boots all day. Definitely a hat and sunscreen, um, light color clothing, light clothing. The um, camera for sure. Yeah, camera for sure, sunglasses, sunblocks. Um, yeah, and yeah, those those would be your generally your, your overall, I guess, your overall package. The country in itself, and you mentioned about several biome types, and you have your rainforest type that includes actually part of Kaichor, so the Kaichor area, and also Ewokram and several of the lodges. Within the rainforest area, you have several lodges that include the Ewokram Lodge, which all within the Ewokram 
forest, which is a million acres of land that has a canopy walkway, a very unique walkway of its type. Um, you have several community lodges by indigenous communities or what we say Amerindian communities, which are owned and managed by the, the communities or the, the indigenous people themselves. And the, those lodges are Sarama Lodge, you have Warapoka Lodge, they're like um, Rewa Lodge. Um, and so there are a few, there are several other lodges that are contained within the forested area. And we're talking about high forests um, and understory birding, including mountain forest areas, would be a forested areas and such. Kaicho National Park is again a very unique area um, in terms of not only having a single highest um, single drop waterfalls in the world, but one of the unique things about Kaicho is that it's one of the key areas in Guyana to see the Guyana cock of the rock. Uh, not a bird that you get there from time to time that likes the cliff area, the cliff area around the falls is the orange-breasted falcon. And that's a bird that's big on a lot of birders' lists in terms of in terms of um yeah having that ticked off on your on your list. The um cock of the rock being unique plumage and such and for those of you who haven't seen the bird, or most people, they get a chance to see why you call the bird cock of the rock due to its nesting behaviors and such. Um, and they're, it's in the Kotinga family, and that's quite a large group for us, in the, and including the characteristic call of one of the rainforest birds, which is a screaming piha, which is a song that um, they even use in the Hollywood movies to, to um, give that indication of being in the, in the forest. This is um, Atta Lodge is our canopy walkway lodge and it's a hole in the forest. I call it a hole in the forest because it's not very large. It's probably just about hmm, maybe two acres. The literal hole is just you have lush vegetation around you. Um, fruiting trees along the edge and that's where you get some of the unique birds. Even Harpy Eagle comes in at the edge of the forest there. So people can be dining in the area what we call a dining area which is actually looking here would be the building to the right and then one of the guys there would shout and oh bird you know whichever bird it might be such and everybody yeah stop eating as i say um you know spoons down and rush out <laughs> when you're buying out some cameras to um, take photos and such you have animals that come into the compounds from um, tapirs and such, and deers, um, agoutis, uh, monkeys, primates, and such that comes along the edge. So Atta Lodge is unique as being, it's being literally a hole in the forest and anything can pop out into the compound or along the edge at any time. Flybys, flyovers, and such. Both of macaws, and macaws, parrots, toucans, and I'm using these general terms because there are several individuals in those, in, several species within those families that um, comes along the edge of the Atta Lodge and many mammals. And that's a view of the canopy walk. So we are right up there into the canopy. There are several sections that you can see out quite a distance or several kilometers. And um, we've seen birds, including harpies in the distance, using a spotting scope on the platform of the canopy um, walkway. Um, the Ewokrama Forest, which contains a canopy walkway, has many unique bird air species. I think their species list is over 600 species of birds. There are some, like one of the more harder parts you see, which is the blue cheek um, Amazon. Then you have um, things like the Rufus wing ground cuckoos. You have several species of macaws. You have, and many of the Guyana shield um, endemic is also found within the Ewokrama forest. And from there, we can, we're heading further south into more open country, into more savanna land. So Surama, which was, it is actually the first, um, which is indigenous owned community based tourism product and, and lodge. It's an introduction into the savanna lands. And that's actually a community whereby the savanna is surrounded by forests. So it's a, it has both the high forests and also mountainous sections, but then with uh, river and lakes around in the neighboring, within the vicinity of the community, but also the community has this 
natural savanna land, and that gives you quite a diversity of um, of birds, especially some of the, many of the Katingas, birds of the Katinga family, including the capuchin bird, legs and such. Um, you have also a highly sought after bird, um, the rufous wing ground cuckoo. That's a, the only ground cuckoo we have here in Guyana. Um, several mannequins and what Sarama is known for more over the past several years is the harpy eagle, nesting harpy eagles. There are two active nest sites, one on the Boro Boro River and one in the forest. And it's one of the places that people go to see harpy eagles and harpy eagle nesting. And one of the sites is now known to be nesting there, being active for the past what past 12 years or more. So it's one of the one of the sites that is more reliable once nesting activity is happening. Because the birds nest, once they nest, then they do that in about a three-year cycle. But the young bird and adults are around and about for two years or so. Um, it's the largest bird, pretty quite a majestic um, creature that hunts on the canopy and even sub canopies. It moves even below the canopy using emergent um, trees or very large trees as local points to do an ambush and to survey what, you know, survey spray. Um, this bird can also be found at Riwa Eco Lodge at certain times, um, Warapoka Lodge and some areas of the Kanuku Mountains, correct? Depending yeah. on the time. Yeah, and there, there are a couple of, couple of other places now that are also um, having the RP or, or seeing old nesting areas and such. So, and those areas are being monitored. So, more as per year, the amount of potential sites for harpy eagles are increasing on a yearly basis. That's great. So now we're gonna go into the savannas. Yep, yeah. so we're moving further south <laughs> into the savannah lands. And um, savannah is unique. It's um, quite, it's much drier. So you're moving down the rainfall gradient, if you wanna call it that. It's the more open grassy areas, the trees are more shrubby and such. And um, they are, it's more prone, to, which is the lodges there are more, they're more cattle ranch style. They're so more ranch style lodges. They, they have um, very good history and very good stories in terms of, you know, with, when you're there in your evening, you're talking to the staff and talking to your guides and, you know, your hosts and such. There are a lot of rich history within the savannah areas. Um, in terms, it's a unique, the savannah lands is very unique. There's a seasonal flooding that happens um, for about three months of the year. So it's something similar nearly to the Pantanal. And there you have, again, that makes what we call the Savannah wetlands. So between the months of middle of May to about the ending of July or so, the Savannah the water around, let's say, around the Rupununi River and the North Rupununi can come up to about five meters or more in height. And it's a seasonal um, system that is needed for the regeneration and regrowth and such of the savanna lands. And due to those wetlands and those wet areas, as the water goes down, it, it, there are certain areas of pools, certain areas of lakes, and that's where you begin to get certain um, species that, species of birds, not only of wildlife, but of birds that like those wet areas and those vast savanna areas. And one of those is the bearded tachuri, the other one is the crested doroditos. And then you have some of the savannah, what you would call more like the savannah beckards, which are um, the white nape xenopsaris. Then you have uh, several ibises there. The, we call, it's also the home to some of the larger creatures, such as the giant anteater and our national flower, which is the Victoria Amazonica, the largest water lily in the world. So those are all part of sections of the savannah dates quite diverse in terms of bird species because you have what we call forest islands within the savannah. So you have forest islands and mountains and forest islands on little dome shapes or little raised areas or slightly elevated areas within the savannah. And those forest islands are give micro unique micro habitats for several species of birds, reptiles, amphibians, and such. So it's quite 
a diverse um, area to see. And many of our, what we call giants of El Dorado, which I mentioned the, the giant anteater, but things like the, the black caiman, the um, green anacondas. We also have the arapaima fish, which is the largest freshwater scale fish in the world. These are all parts of the savannah wetlands area. And like Wally said, with those little patches of forest within the savannas, that's why we chose this feature area to, to um, have the highlighted image. This is actually the village of Karasabai. And it's known for birding and wildlife spotting as well. But one of the biggest attractions here, and Wally will go a little bit more into it, is that it's also more commonly known as the home of the sun parakeet. Yep. The sun corner or sun parakeet, which is um, a very, it's a, a medium sized parakeet or so. So, medium sized meaning about uh, 12 inches or thereabouts. Um, and as you can see there, that's the color. It's, that's just the color of one bird. So, you can imagine a group of two dozen birds together, you know, with they're really spectacular, really um, beautiful birds. And they are within Karasabai, which is actually one of our border communities not too far off from the Guyana Brazil border and it's in a way part of the savannah lands and the, the foothills of the um, the Pacaraima mountains so the only place in Guyana you can actually see um, these sun parakeets is going to Karasubai and while going there to Karasubai or within that vicinity it also give you a chance to also look along the Irin River, which is not too far away, but for the Rio Bronco and bird and the Hori Crotus Pine Tail, two other unique birds that only around the Karasubai area and between Karasubai and what we call um, the Letter Mirror, which is a section that going interior-wise would fly back to Georgetown. That bit of river and that bit of forest along the river, that's the only place in the entire country that you can actually get let's say these three species. So the sun parakeet, Rio Bronco amber, and the hoary throat is fine tail. And this is a bird that was only, I think, rediscovered in the early 1990s ago. It was thought to be extinct. It was um, over, the population was decimated by you know, harvesting for the songbird trade. It's called a red siskin. There's another one, Another siskin is called a woody siskin, which is more black and which is a um, lemonish or yellowish green coloration. Um, the hoodie siskin is a little bit more easier to see than the red siskin. You can also see the hoodie siskin in Karasubai, but the red siskin is quite an endangered species. It's only found generally in not only Rukununi, but actually in the South Rukununi savannas. So that's where it's located. Um, they're now making a real a population come back there probably i would say probably about 100 individuals and in maybe three different locations all in in the south of Pununi. the birds are being monitored and searched by a group of youngsters some being school kids and their mentors would be individuals who are also guides um who are in their 20s or 30s, or what you would say teenagers and kids are the ones that are monitoring these birds here in the South um, Rukununi. They form a conservation group called the South Rukununi Conservation Society. And they would do from, um, what do you call it, uh, banding, from banding and also looking at where to see the birds, the times of the year they see the bird, what the bird are doing, you know, what the species are doing and all of that. So quite a program so that they can learn and that's an ongoing program so they can learn as much as possible for this endangered species. Our coming back now closer to midway to the coast and we really come back into what we call a white sand belt. That's an area that has a different vegetation type. It's more of a scrubby soil, but within that area too you have um, several water bodies, lakes and what we call conservancies and such and in that area you have several species of birds because they are open sections, open lands, and you have ibises, um, several blackbirds, a lot of water waterfowls uh, in that area. And the forested section have certain trees that bear fig-like fruits that we call duca. 
um, due to that, you have several cotingas and several mannequin species that are there. That white sand area also have, including the Rupununi, would have borrowing owls, which are owls that live in the ground that have their burrow and they dig their own, if you want to call it, little den in the ground. So there are many, many um, species of birds as you go along the hilly sand and clay region. And coming right back down on the coast, and includes from which is at the top left hand corner, which is the Unix area. There are terms of um, mangroves area and coming lower, moving along that enclosed area right down to near the, the Guyana um, Sornam border. That's our whole coastal area, which includes the Essequibo Islands, islands in the Essequibo River. The Essequibo River, which is the third largest river in Guyana, uh, third largest river in South America, actually, the largest river in Guyana that has many islands and due, islands are mainly forested or secondary forested because there are some plantations and, and such on those islands historically so you have different vegetation categories that host many species of birds that like pristine habitat and including birds that like edge habitats so or edge effects and disturb habitats and along the what you would call the um, the tidal zone, which are species that are mainly waders and showbirds. So a lot of the showbirds, this seeing showbirds, this is where you, this is the part of the country that you need to be to see many of our showbird species. And also many of the species that are specific to mangroves. So things like the Rufus crab hawks and also the blood-colored woodpecker, bicolor combills, which are only species that you can see in this coastal bit. It includes um, Georgetown and in the botanical gardens and areas along or, you know, we see along the sea walls, the mud flats there, and then going out of town, our commuter areas like the Mahaika River and the Abari Zone and such, and Mahaika River, Abari River are those small rivers heading East, so between Georgetown and heading east towards Suriname direction is where you have those rivers are also the home of the Hawatsin or the Kanji pheasant. And that's the bird, our national bird, <laughs> um, looking like, I would say, like an Archaeopteryx, like a, a living um, fossil or a living dinosaur. It's um, commonly called a Kanji pheasant, gets its name combination to self, looking pheasant like and based upon a location called the Kanji River, which is the river east of the Burbis River. Um, it's a, quite a social bird. It's very poor regulatory body temperature, so it doesn't regulate its body temperature quite like other, if you want to call it more recent bird or more recently developed, evolved bird as such. So Kanji pheasants, they, seeing this bird, you need to get to the site early. So as the sun comes up, the birds are out there opening its wing and warming up and feeding on leaf. It's a full, fully avoid, it feeds strictly on leaves. And as the sun begins to get a little warmer, meaning like around 8 a.m. or so, the birds get back under the vegetation and go under cover. So they do not like a lot of sun. Um, so this bird is early in the morning or late in the afternoon after I would say after 4 30 p.m. because we have a sundown. Our timelines are strict. We are Guyana is very located just kind of like four to six degrees um, north of the equator. We have basically it's a sharp sundown and a sharp sunrise. So on average I would say 12 hours of sunlight and 12 hours of darkness. So you have those two an hour and a half in the morning into the sunrise and the last hour and a half of daylight, those are the two best times of seeing the Hoatzins. And some of our very um, sought after will be one, the, the Crested Doradito, the Holy Trotus Pantillion, and the Crestless Curacao. And these birds, the one of the beauty of again is that once you're there in the habitat, once and what I mean by that, you're there in the general ecotones or the different regions or such. Once you're there in the environment, they're 
very, very good chances of you seeing um, these species. And one of the other things about us being again is that as you move from lodge to lodge, especially by boat or by vehicle, those transfer between lodges is actually an uh, excursion in itself. So a lot of times, even though you you know your itinerary might say um, yeah it takes two hours to move from lodge A to B or an hour to lodge A you know it sometimes doubles that time because you can have anything popping out of the literally if you want to say out of the woodwork you can be doing a transfer from um, the after the canopy walkway lodge to the Surama lodge and you know a cat or a tapir any one of the big cats or even small cats. So we're talking about jaguars, um, puma, ocelot, or anyone that could come out onto the road. And that right away, is everyone stops and stairs. you know stares and take out cameras and the kind of stuff. Or you be driving along and then there's a ruckus and you look and there's mokas screaming. You stop to take a look at the mokas and then the guy may turn around and say, "Oh, the reason the mokas there making all of that um, racket is because over there, look, far high up in that tree is a harpy." You know, so they're responding. So the macaws is what made the noise that caught everyone's attention, or at least the guy's attention and such. And he stops, and everybody stops looking at the macaw, and then you see the reason why they're making a racket. So that's some of the things going along with boats, and you're there relaxing, enjoying the breeze in the boat, and have on your hat and such. And the sun is on you, and then all of a sudden the boatman stops, and everybody looks at the boat captain, and he's pointing across to the other bank of the river and says, "There." And then you look, you see. There is a giant river out in the water, and maybe two more relaxing on the riverbank. So those are things that happen in terms of um, constantly and, <laughs> and continuously. So in telling visitors, or as we do our daily briefing as guides, we've always mentioned to people, especially the day that the day before we're ready to change, move from lodge A to B or such, we said, that, okay, tomorrow we're going to depart at this time. And um, but have your binoculars close as hand. Make sure your batteries are charged. Um, for your cameras and have your cameras very close to hand because you never know what's going to pop up or what you're going to see around the next bend. <laughs> um, and I know that it is a burning webinar, but no trip to Ghana is complete without touching on some of the dishes that you're going to see here. Um, so like we previously mentioned, Ghana is known for its six different ethnic groups and that comes out a lot in the types of food that we have as well. So us being the land of many waters, we do have a lot of fish. Um, so that gives rise to like seafood burgers or salt fish and bake, which is the bottom left hand image here. From our East Indian culture, we get a lot of different types of curries and it is more masala and garam masala based as opposed to tomato based like you might find in India. Um, one of the most popular dishes that come from our indigenous peoples is pepper pot. And the main area, the main, um, the ingredient for this actually comes from cassava, which is one of their staple too. There is a version of it that is called tuma pot that is made from the cassava water as opposed to the ground cassava that pepper spot is made from. Um, some of our local operators here that focus a little bit more on birdie tours are Evergreen Adventures. They do a very big focus on coastal um, tours. Leon More Nature Experiences, which is also another great birding guide like um, Wally himself and some of the images that you've actually seen in this presentation are from Leon more specifically other photographers that we worked with were the Prester Clark some are Lee, Wally's himself um, we have Ron Alicock birding tours and wilderness explorers who is the only DMC here in Guyana and the one that Wally works as a freelance guide he works very close with Wally also works with some of our North American companies as well that bring on tours here um, that are more birding specific also. Just for some more information, you can visit our destination website at www.guyanatourism.com, which is the official destination website of Guyana. Um, to get more information on coastal tours for birding, you can visit evergreenadventuresgy.com. Wilderness Explorers, you can also visit them at wildernessexplorers.com. You can visit exploregana.com, which is the private se sector sister agency to the Ghana Tourism Authority. Um, statisticsgana.gov.gy, the official website of the Bureau of Statistics. 
go invest for tourism opportunities, investment opportunities in Guyana, and the official website of our main Chedi Jagan International Airport at cgairport-gy.com. Um, before I turn this over to Jenna for any final questions, this is some of our team at the Guyana Tourism Authority. Um, for any other assistance for new operators and airlines, we provide key information, assist with coordinating travel-related events, work on joint advertising, support found trips, some are also very birding specific ones, although Wally mentioned you might be lucky enough to see a jaguar, anaconda, which isn't a part of the itinerary, but it's part of the magic about being here. Um, negotiating hotel rates and working with our private sector as well. Um, thank you, Wally, for joining us. If you cannot tell by the two different tones of our voice, Wally is very passionate about birders, which he has every right to be. I'm not a birder as much as he is, but just throughout my time and knowing him, I think it's great to see that passion and to really see it in action here where he explains everything here. Um, so Jenna, over to you. Perfect, thank you so much. Thank you, Wally as well for joining us and Nicola for your time. We did get quite a few questions come through now. A lot of them are more specific, so I will make sure to answer those in the follow-up email, but I will ask you a couple of the more general ones right now, Nicola. So the first question we have is about the standard of the lodges. So a couple different people asked about that. For example, do they have air conditioning? Are they considered luxury, attached bathrooms, etc.? Um, so these are not luxurious lodges. They are very basic accommodation. They will mimic what our indigenous peoples look like. They're very comfortable lodges, but you would not have air conditioning in the lodges, nor hot water. And to be quite honest, Ghana is hot a lot of the time, so you might not need that when you're going birding um, during the day. There is also not a lot of Wi-Fi for the lodges that are in the rainforest or the savanna areas. You will get Wi-Fi when you're on the coast. Um, however, for those lodges in the interior regions and in the interior rainforest and savanna regions, you might get them later on in the evening and it, some of them will be paid. It's probably about $5 um, for an, a half an hour to an hour. Um, it's not, and it is, it doesn't go through with images very well, but you do get to send emails and WhatsApp messages as well. Perfect. Thank you. Um, another question here. Do they use, do you use birding apps for on the phone to attract birds? I'll let Wally take that. Um, yes, no, more and more recently, I've seen people coming with birding apps. Um, I personally, and many of the guys who have also handed them that bit of recording is, I use audios which I've accumulated over time of the different bird species. Um, in, in, yeah, in Guyana, I've subdivided my stuff into the, diff the different groups, but we do use playbacks, especially for many of the um, little more hard to get ones, especially in the forest. So things like foliage gleaners and some of the ant birds, ant friends, um and such so more of the secretive cryptic birds yes we do use um playbacks to get them we don't use it aggressively so that's one of the things that i train guides not to do but um one of the things we also do is uh which is a natural whist yeah. whistling so we would wh actually we would whistle to imitate the bird some to get a you know like a reaction and such or, or to do what we call trolling trolling or fishing for birds, meaning as you're walking along a forest trail or such, and you, you know, you might say, hey, this is a nice patch of forest that I think A, B, X, and Y might be found here. And if you're familiar with the tune, you whistle it. As a guide, if I go even into a new destination or such, I would ask the local guide, um, you know, have you ever seen this bird here? Or do you, are you familiar with this tune? And I would either play it or, make the whistling sound and then the guide would tell me yes or no or the last time he heard it was you know such and such a time back and such so that's how we would fish for birds one of the things to go to as an additional as a layer, um is at all the lodges that we go to especially the interior lodges they're very good wildlife and nature guides so other than having me being along as a group or even if some groups come with their international tour leaders each lodge has more than one guide that can accompany the group 
And for most of the lodges, general, yeah, all of our lodges, they're basically what you would say about eight rooms, which let's call it twin accommodation. So you're talking about the maximum of 16 persons, but a group size of six to 10 persons, looking at co accommodation requests of both double or twin and single um, requests, a group of eight, nine, 10 persons could actually have the lodge to themselves. So that's one of the one of the other neat things about Guyana. Not only <laughs> about English speaking, and you can talk to anyone, you know, and learn a learn a lot about. Uh, I'm talking about also in a way the what intimate we call, experience. Yeah, the intimate experience of having that full lodge. I mean, staff and hosting and everything to yourself as a group from some groups even as small as six sometimes have the entire lodge to themselves. So that's one of the great things about here too. So when Wally talks about local guides, yes, he is a local guide as well, um, but he is more stationed in the Georgetown area. So what would happen if there is a group that he's working with, he is their tour leader mm -hmm. or overall yeah. guide that is going to carry them from Georgetown to four to three to four different lodges in different areas in the rainforest and savannas. But for every community and every lodge that you stay at, there is also one or two guides that are found at that local lodge in that local community. That community yeah. So any excursion or day trips that you take out from that local community or lodge, you will be getting your overall guide, which would be someone like Wally or someone like Leon. And you'll also be getting some of the local guides from that area. One of the cool things though, is that those local guides know that community like the back of their hands or something. Really <laughs> knew that they might know that Wally might not know this is where they get to teach him and vice versa if Wally has been to a place that they haven't before that's where they get to learn too um one of the things that we are doing at the GTA here when we do trainings um like this like Wally mentioned he are he is training some local guides is to have guides learn from one another and their experiences as well so Wally is I believe you're a lead trainer on yeah. certain things yeah. Wally is one of the GTA's licensed lead trainer um, for birding and adventure travel as well. And he works with us with training a lot of local up and coming guides in these indigenous communities. Wonderful. Thank you for that great explanation. You actually answered a couple of the other questions within that. So that's perfect. <laughs> I will just ask one last one. There's still many more. So we will make sure to answer those in the follow up email. But this is the last one I'll ask you right now, Nicola and, or Wally. This is how many days is recommended for a typical birding itinerary? Hmm. Uh, let's say together. Cover everything. I would say probably 12 days. Yeah. 12 days, so that's your day, your night one, if I would call it that, your night one in, in on the coast, so that's the, the afternoon you're flying like today, so tonight you're on the coast, and then tomorrow you depart for your interior lodges. And then your last night number 12, or your 12th night back in the coast, so you arrive back to Georgetown today, you spend tonight, and then tomorrow morning in the wee hours or at 5 a.m. you leave the hotel to depart out of Guyana. So, my recommendation would be, yeah, 12 nights. So 10 nights interior-wise or, or such, or 10 nights full. In the rainforest and, and, and such. And um, your two, night one and night 12, or your two final, you know, welcome and your bye-bye, goodbye nights. So that's um, about um, 12 nights in country, and that does not include travel days. So if you are coming from the US, it takes, uh, depending on where you're coming from, um, all I direct connections from Miami or New York, it's the longest is about six hours. So you should add on another day and a half to two days to be your travel days to that. But that's 12 nights in country. Yeah. Minimum. <laughs> Minimum. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for that, Wally, Nicola. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. This webinar did go a little long today, but we did have a secondary guest host. So... We thank you for sticking out, sticking it out with us. And I did get some requests to send those URLs in the follow-up as well. So I will make sure to send that up. I will be coming to you tomorrow. We'll have the webinar recording out. So thank you again, everybody, for your time for joining us. And once again, to Nicola and Wally, thank you guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jenna. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good week. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Is it on the, where is it? Um,